Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to this webinar uh, hosted by the Wachusett Regional School District. My name is Brendan Keenan. I'm the District Director of Social Emotional Learning. Uh, really excited to be uh, hosting this live webinar for you all on a rainy night here in central Massachusetts. Perfect weather for a, uh, for a webinar. Um, this topic is so important. The title is Caring for Your Child During COVID. Our two presenters, Dr. Jessica Griffin and Dr. Heather Forkey, are uh, actually parents that live within our towns, uh, within our five towns. And they're also uh, speakers all over the country and all over the world, really, uh, on the topic of trauma and also parenting. So uh, they're gonna talk about themselves. But uh, the reason we're, we're offering this webinar is really in response to our conversations with parents over the, um, the months of the pandemic. Uh, just hearing about the stress that has been accumulating for everybody and um, really as a district wanting to be responsive and provide what we can that could be helpful. Um, really the word hope is what we're trying to cling on to during these times and to um, as much as possible maintain an optimistic outlook, which can be so difficult uh, many months into this pandemic. So um, really uh, glad that we're gonna have a lot of people joining us through YouTube Live. This will also be available to be viewed afterwards as well. So. Um, Really glad to have everybody join us, and I will now turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm super excited to be here with all of you. My name is Jessica Griffin. Uh, when Brendan first reached out to us, of course, the first thing was, what do you mean? I'm a parent, and there's no manual for how to parent during a pandemic, um, but there are there is a lot that we know about how children can bounce back and bounce forward and be resilient even during times of stress. Um, as Brendan said, we are also moms of kids in the Wachusett District. I have three children at the Paxton Center School, and this day has been Wachusett Day. We did a training earlier for nurses and counselors, but I also did parent um, pick up supplies and meet teachers and three different Google Meets with three different teachers today. So I am there with all of you. I showed up at the wrong time this morning for two of, out of my three children. So uh, we are in this together. We want to be a resource to parents in the district and this evening. I'm going to first turn it over to my colleague Heather to talk about um, what we know about trauma and stress and COVID-19. And as a psychologist, I'll talk about some mental health strategies and how to support your kids' emotional health during this time. I am, as Brendan said, we do a lot of training. I'm the executive director of the Child Trauma Training Center at UMass, where we're a statewide center focused on helping children who've experienced trauma and stressful events. And I'm also the executive director of a national center called the Resilience Through Relationship Center, which is a new center focused on improving parent-child relationships and the attachment relationship. And there's my contact information at the bottom, which we'll share again at the end. And with that said, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Heather Forkey. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am a pediatrician here at UMass. Um, my day job is that I, I do serve as a director for our child protection program and our foster children evaluation service. So a lot of my work helps to care for kids in our community who are dealing with an awful lot of trauma um, and certainly that's actually true for all of us right now as we deal with COVID-19. So we wanted to touch base on what we know about COVID-19 and COVID-19 in kids in particular, kind of a brief touch on some of the physical health issues, but really talk about what, what about the stress of COVID and some strategies to manage all of that. You know, there was this funny Facebook uh, thing going on during COVID where they had a, a comedian uh, woman who came on and she pretended to be a government official. And she was talking about the paradoxes really of COVID. She would say things, she said things like, of course, you know that everyone has to stay home, but unless you need to go out, then of course you should go out and all stores must close, except of course the stores that must stay open. And all of us all summer long we're talking to each other in the neighborhood saying what have you heard now is school open is school closed what what's going on and that conflicting information has not just been around school but it's really been about everything related to covid how should we be protecting ourselves how should we be protecting the kids who is it most at risk and and what do we do and what we learn seems to change almost every day you know we here in the medical community, we're getting 
absolutely conflicting information, do this and the exact opposite at the exact same time. And I know that everyone has been feeling the stress of that. A big part of where the stress has come from is the fact that COVID-19 showed up and we in the medical community didn't know what to say. We didn't, we were not familiar with it. And many people have come to us here at UMass to ask questions about what should I be worried about for kids? There is some basic information that we now understand. And so I, I am not here to present a, a long or extensive information about the immunology or, or um, issues of how we treat COVID. But I think it's important to know that children are at similar risk of getting infected with COVID as adults. Um, but they don't seem to get very sick with it. So when kids get COVID, which is really much less common for them to get sick than for adults, um, they get fever, chills, cough, difficulty breathing, and tiredness like adults. Some kids get muscle aches, some congestion, runny nose, sore throat, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and they also can get the loss of smell or taste. Those are the things that you've heard really in the news. The thing that we've been really struck by is the fact that kids who get COVID or SARS COVID-2, which is the other medical term for COVID-19, have very mild symptoms. While all the UMass got turned into an ICU for adults, we in pediatrics were relatively untouched. And in general, any pediatric patients who did get sick had a great prognosis and recovered within a week or two after disease onset. That also then has brought up, okay, so what should we do to protect ourselves and protect kids? And you certainly have heard a lot about hand washing, about social distancing, but masks have been the other issue. How to mask, what to mask, should I mask, do I have to mask, and how to have help kids to mask. I will say using cabbage as a mask is not recommended. Using cloth masks or using masks that we use in the medical setting are both ones that can be used. In general, the cloth coverings should fit snugly around the side of the face, be secured with ties or ear loops, include multiple layers of fabric, but allow for breathing without restriction. And you wanna be able to launder and wash them without changing their shape, because the idea is that you're breathing on one side, but they're also potentially, the, the mask is there to protect you from droplets coming to the other side. So you wanna keep them real, going through the wash and being cleaned. I think that there has been legitimate concerns about, well, what about masks and kids? I can't keep a mask on a child and I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that this isn't gonna work for my child or you know, that there are issues around masking kids. And we're gonna talk more about those issues in terms of stressors and in terms of how we perceive danger and threat. The physical act of wearing a mask is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics for kids two and up and certainly <laughs> Keeping a mask on a child is a challenge. Um, I think one of the things is that, like everything else, we want to apply reasonable behavior if a, your child is someone who can tolerate it and keep that mask on. In general, it's a better idea to do so if they're out and among other people. But what all of this does is lead to a huge amount of stress on kids and parents. You know, me, like you guys, are at home with our kids way more than we were before. Many people are working exclusively from home and trying to do that while trying to juggle kids and their needs. And that has impacts on the kids' stress level and impacts on our stress level, and we're feeding each other in terms of those stressors. And so everybody is dealing with anxiety. This sense of what's gonna happen in the future, what can I expect for injury and illness? What can I expect economically? What can I expect academically? What can I expect from the mental health that this is impacting on us as adults and on our kids? And it can really feel overwhelming. And there's some legitimate reasons why we feel that way. But the flip side of this is that this also provides an opportunity for kids and parents. You know, one of the things that Jess and I talk about um, a lot with the various, in the various settings that we're in, 
is that resilience is really always our goal for children. And we're trying to build resilience for kids in times of stress or calm. For a long time, people thought that resilience was something you either had or didn't have. But it turns out that resilience is not something you're born with or something that only a few people have. It's actually something that you learn and grow into. It's defined as this dynamic process of positive adaptation to or in spite of significant adversities. We've got a significant adversity here in COVID-19. But the other thing that we have in COVID-19 are the pathways to resilience. Because this definition, which was come, that came was uh, a researcher named Ann Maston came up with, has with it also the way that we get there. And the way that kids get there is through the give and take of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships that are continuous over time. That's your relationships with your kids. That's our neighborhood relationships with the kids. That's the school's relationships with kids. And it's in that growth that occurs through play, exploration, and exposure to a variety of normal activities and resources. Isn't that actually exciting? And what's even more fun about this definition is that Ann Mastin called it ordinary magic. And I love that term, right? It's ordinary, it's happening for most kids without us even noticing. Every day, all day, our kids are growing in resilience. And yet there is something magical about it because in these moments where all of our resilience is challenged, we actually have to go back and think, hmm, what is it that we need to put back in place so that resilience continues to grow? What are those strings that we need to pull so that it continues to happen for our kids and honestly for ourselves as well? What we want is for kids to come out of this and say about the next stressor, hey, you know, I can handle whatever it is because I managed COVID-19. I am really capable. Part of what I need to do whenever I'm trying to understand what I should do is I need to understand the why. I need to understand if people are gonna tell me these are the things you should do, I need to understand what, well, why? What, what's going on behind that? And as we talk about some of the different things, strategies for helping yourself and your kids, understanding why we'd say that is a big piece of, of being able to do it most effectively. And one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand is that when we are dealing with all of this stress and anxiety, we are having stress responses. Now, most of you have heard about stress responses in terms of the freeze response. That's that deer in the headlights. Under some kinds of threats, we just stop and we can't move forward. And certainly for some people during COVID-19, it has been so overwhelming that they have been frozen by the, the, the horrible things that they've had to deal with. Another stress response that you've heard of is fight or flight. This is that concept of under a threat, you try to run away from it or fight it. And that, is true that many people are dealing with so much threat that they feel that they have to fight back or run from the threats. But we as humans use these actually as a secondary stress response because for humans, freezing and fight or flight are not actually all that effective. So think about the threats that we're usually talking about when we deal with severe danger. We're talking about a tiger chasing you, right? If you freeze or you try to fight or you try to run, if it's you and a tiger, usually the tiger's gonna win, especially if it's a child or if someone with children, you're not gonna be effective at fighting or fleeing. So actually we as humans evolved and we developed a much more useful stress response called the affiliate response. It's also called tend and befriend. And what that means is that under threat, we actually look to each other and we say, hey, I got a bad thing going on here. And can anybody help me with this? We look for cues from the people around us. And when we see that there are people who can help us, our stress actually drops. But if we look left and right, and there's either nobody there or the people who are there can't help us or won't help us, we actually get more and more stressed. And so one of the things that's fundamental about what's happened with COVID-19 is that it's knocked, our, knocked us out at the affiliate side, right? We've been kept away from the very people that we need to turn to, to provide our safety and security. We're, we've been locked away from them. For our kids, however, they can look left and right and find us. So how can we 
provide that affiliate support for our kids and how can we seek it out and and get it for ourselves so we can come back to the table and address these stressors in the most effective way with the affiliate response you know there are ways that we need to be able to look at situations to perceive safety when our brains are shoving us down into our lower primitive brain and telling us to be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. That's happening for us as we turn on the news, as we listen to what's going on, as we get confused by all the different things that we're told, we actually lose our sense of safety and we go down into our lower brain. What that means is that you're in the part of the brain that doesn't allow you to think, that doesn't allow you to do the things that are the most logical. And so how, do, how can we look and try to perceive safety? How we perceive safety as humans most effectively is in the connections with others. That we look for safety in the people that are around us because that is the most effective way for us to feel safe. And so what we wanna do for ourselves and for kids is to make sure that we're doing all we can to promote those connections. In pediatrics, we talk about stress as being positive, tolerable, or toxic stress. You know, all kids experience stress. It's not that kids go through life without stress. It's that most stress for kids under normal circumstances is a positive stress. Those are things like an exam at school or playing in a game, a soccer game or a baseball game where it's they have to perform. Those are things that challenge kids and allow them to grow and to move on to the next thing. There are many things that kids experience that we would consider tolerable stresses. These are things that can be pretty bad, things like a grandparent dying or a house fire or potentially COVID-19. They are pretty bad in and of themselves, but they get buffered by supportive relationships. It is when the stressor is bad but there is an absence of protective relationships that stress becomes toxic to kids. When it becomes such a stress that it begins to impact their brains and bodies in ways that are significantly negative and can have negative impacts throughout the lifespan. And so again, we come back to this concept that we have to keep kids in these protective supportive relationships so that we can turn down the impact of this stress and turn COVID-19 from a stressor into an opportunity, not just to bounce back, but to bounce forward. One of the easiest ways that we have to do this is to use our three R's, not the three R's for school, but reassuring, restoring routine and regulating. One of the things that kids need to hear from us all the time is that they are safe, they are safe, they are safe. You know, think about when you have felt the most at threat. You have looked around you and said, is there someone here who can assure my safety? In COVID-19, you may have turned to the doctors to say, are we safe? If you're on an airplane flight and you start to feel turbulence, you listen for, is the pilot telling us that we are safe? We need to hear and know that we are safe in order for us to move on. If we know we're safe, we can get out of that lower brain. And for kids, this can be done through words, telling them that they are safe. Saying, we've got this, we're under control, we can manage this, this is something that we know how to handle. Those are important messages that kids get. Kids also get messages of safety through our touch, that we give them pets and we give them hugs and we show them, you're safe here, I got you covered. Sometimes we do things like create tents and forts, little places where they feel even safer. More we can do to make sure kids feel safe is an important piece. Some of that safety comes especially from routine. Routine is so critical to our days because it takes away from the stress parts of our day, all the things that are gonna happen all the time. So having a wake up routine, having a bedtime routine, having a homework routine, having a dinner routine, those take away from our conscious brain all the things that we can put on autopilot and they tell kids and adults that the world is predictable. Predictability is a huge measure of safety. So the more we can get back to routines, even for teenagers, is so important. The last R is regulating. Regulating is a combination of understanding what your emotion is and then being able to manage it. And we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about some ways that we can help kids to name and identify their feelings and then to bring them back a notch. 
So let's think about some of the symptoms that perhaps you and I and our kids have had during COVID-19. Not sleeping is a big one. And there's some real good physiologic reasons why we're not sleeping. When we leave the affiliate response behind and we get pushed over into fight or flight, another part of the brain that gets stimulated is what's called the reticular activating system. This is that part of your brain that was developed when we lived in the wilderness. And if there was a tiger pacing outside of our cave, it was not a good idea to go to sleep. And so when there is a threat out there, our brain turns on and it says, don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep, you're in danger. And this has been a huge thing during COVID. In fact, they have a whole new diagnostic term called COVID-related insomnia because it has gotten into our brains and it's turned our reticular activating systems up. It's happened for kids too. And so many people are having difficulty sleeping. That reassuring that you can do for a child that they are safe, they are safe, is a huge piece of helping them to calm back down so that they can sleep. Letting them know that you are there that they are gonna be fine and that they can go to sleep safely knowing that they're gonna be fine when they wake up in the morning. Part of that reassuring is how we talk to kids about COVID-19. And people often ask me, how can I do that? And it really depends on what level your child's at. Certainly what you say to a 16 year old is not the same as what you say to a five year old, but they are basically follow the same steps. The first is to open up the conversation and say, hey, what have you heard about COVID-19? What have you heard about what's going on at school with COVID-19? What have you heard about with your friends in terms of COVID-19? Have the kids feed back to you what they've heard and ask them to tell you what things they might be worried about. Because what we can often do is correct inaccuracies. Many times kids have heard something, on, especially on media or social media, which is wildly untrue or a huge exaggeration of some small truth. And so being able to correct those inaccuracies right at the butt is an important piece. Kids also need to be able to ask questions and we answer honestly. And some of those answers are, I'm not quite sure, or we don't know yet, or the doctors are trying to figure that out, or your teachers are still trying to work on figuring out how we're gonna do that but you wanna make sure that you answer the question that is asked. If a child asks you, how, can, how am I gonna get COVID-19? You're obviously not gonna launch into a whole discussion about the immunology of how the virus might in, in, engulf the cells of their lungs should they catch it. You're gonna to talk to them about the fact that when you wash your hands and when you stay at a distance, and if we wear masks, we actually really reduce our chances of getting it at all. A big piece of this is also limiting media. You know, the media gets paid to stimulate our lower brain. The media gets paid to make sure that we feel fear so that we continue to watch. It's actually not getting paid to stimulate the higher part of our brain. And so using media in very small doses is really important. And then getting back to those routines and the regulation pieces that we're gonna talk about is a really important part of all of this reassurance. Again, getting to routines as quickly as you can now, especially around school starting, getting back to a bedtime routine, getting back to a dinner routine, getting back to a nighttime bedtime that kids definitely go to. And a lot of that needs to include carefully monitoring what's coming through on their devices. Because if we don't get these kids into routine, we're gonna continue to be stimulating those stress responses. And routine is actually important, especially for adolescents. A lot of times people say, well, I can do that for my little kids, but we actually have to make routines for adolescents as well. Certainly bedtimes might be later and they might include more access to uh, their devices, but making sure that we do think about routines for older kids is incredibly important. And then regulating, you know, when we talk about sleep, Oftentimes people will say, oh yeah, I heard about using a nightlight. I heard about making sure that we turn off all the devices. But one of the things that we often forget to talk about is the fact that what we want kids to know is that we are thinking about them and with them, even when they go to sleep. You know, we have this concept in America that you figure yourself out and you manage yourself. We don't figure ourselves out. We get figured out by those people who help us figure ourselves out, our parents. And one of those big pieces is knowing that that parent is constantly thinking of you. So for kids, when they're trying to go to sleep, oftentimes there is this deep-seated fear that I'm being forgotten about, or when I go to sleep, 
I'm not being, I'm not, the parent that's here is going to go off and not know that I'm doing this or not remember me. So making sure that they have a, um, something that reminds them that you are always thinking about them. Talking about an invisible string that keeps you guys connected. Having a lovey object that goes into their bed. Putting sticky notes around their room that say, I love you and I'm thinking about you. Having a lovey object that they keep and that you keep that reminds them that you're always, when they look at their lovey and you look at your lovey, you're always thinking about each other. This may seem kind of simple for sleep and maybe unnecessary, but the concept is really important and it bleeds over into the rest of their days. You know, one of the big things is that many kids are having tantrums and getting aggressive and having trouble getting along with people in the house and maybe even their friends. So what about using our three R's for those? Well, one of the big pieces of reassurance for kids is our ability as the parents to sort of hold that energy that they have. If we can hold their, their upset and keep it for them, recognizing that it's not really directed at us, it's directed at the situation, it's directed at the fact that they can't play with who they wanna play with, that they can't be with their friends, that they can't do what they wanna do, and say, I got this, okay, let's, let me hold it for you. What that requires is that we as the parents have to be you know, this huge emotional container for these emotions that kids have. But those emotions aren't bad. Those emotions are natural. And recognizing and saying to kids, have the emotion, I got this. And letting them discharge it. And you know, not abusively and not constantly, but saying, you know what? It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be disappointed that we can't do all those things we plan to do. And saying, I got that. I feel that way too. Let me hold it with you. That's a big piece of reassuring kids. So we're gonna tolerate those strong emotions. We're gonna recognize that kids are gonna act out with us, but that most of the time, it's not really an emotion about us. It's about the situation. And if we can respond calmly and help to name the feelings, we're gonna be in a better place. Kind of what all of this gets at is to try and regulate kids who are losing it and recognizing that regulation of kids doesn't happen spontaneously but it happens through a process of developing with your caregiver that sense of regulation what it means is that first a caregiver has to regulate themselves and that's us holding our own emotions and holding the emotions of our kids what happens is that we can hold that emotion then kids begin to learn the skills of regulating they are mirroring what we do. They are reflecting what we do. And we are allowing them opportunities to model our behavior and try it out for themselves. And over time, that's what's allowing them to learn their own self-regulation. That process is stepwise. This also gets back to that concept of keeping the mind in mind. You know, as I mentioned, in America, we have this false concept that you figure yourself out. Well, when a baby cries, we pick up the baby and we say, oh, you're hungry. And the baby learns, oh, this is hunger. And when you, the baby gets fed, they learn people help me with being hungry. And when a little kid gets frustrated and we come up to the child and we say, hey, you're frustrated, buddy, let me help you. The child learns this is frustration and people can help me with that. Well, imagine the kid for whom they cry an adult says, oh, would you just shut up? You're so greedy. A child learns that this feeling is greedy and no one helps you with that. And similarly, if a child gets frustrated, and they get told, what are you, stupid? You can't figure it out? They learn something very different about themselves. They learn that they can't manage this situation and they can't grow from it. Well, doing, being frustrated during COVID-19 is not exactly that severe. How we respond to kids in their frustration, in their moments, allows them to begin to see themselves as capable and the world as manageable. And those are the things that we want them to, to have from this moment that we can give them in each and every interaction. That is co-regulation. And that is the critical gift of this time is that we have so many moments day to day to do that. So it really matters how we manage ourselves so we can co-regulate kids and kids can learn that self-regulation. I'm gonna turn it over to Jess so she can talk more about how we do that. Great, thank you, Heather, for all of that wonderful information and the medical background too is really helpful. I'm gonna talk about what regulation looks like and different ways we can calm that stress response um, in children. And I understand that some of you may have very young children, others have teenagers, so we'll try to mix this up a bit if we can. 
Next slide, please. So with regulation skills or relaxation skills, any sort of stress management tools or techniques, this is going to be individualized. What works for one child may not work for another, and that's okay. Try a few things out and see what works best for them. I'm, I'm going to share some resources um, and some different suggestions, but as you can see, it's very small on the screen here. There are hundreds of ways in which you can calm that response system down, that stress response system down in the body. And that's really what regulation is about in calming that stress response through these relaxation skills. And one of those, the um, Sesame Street photo you here see of Elmo, that's Elmo's belly breathing. So for parents of young children, if you go on sesamestreet.org or sesamestreetincommunities.org um, or just Google um, you, or YouTube, um, Elmo belly breathing, there's a cute um, belly breathing video that's really easy to use with kids. I've used it with my own children. I'll sh share some apps uh, later on as well. Next slide. And so mindfulness, you all have heard about mindfulness and how important that is. And there's a lot of scientific backing for why mindfulness works, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. You can do a mindfulness technique in 30 to 60 seconds. And I'm gonna talk through a number of these relatively quickly, but these are things you can do in order to calm that um, stress response in children. And by the way, it works in grownups too. Uh, so something like what we call progressive muscle relaxation, which is where we squeeze our muscles. So pick a muscle group in the body and squeeze it really tightly, hold it to count of five. You can do this with your kids or teach them how to do this. And you squeeze that, squeeze that, squeeze that, and then you let it go and notice the, the difference in between the tension and relaxation. And you repeat that exercise throughout your body. By the way, there are also some great um, progressive muscle relaxation exercises on YouTube or videos that you could use with your children as well. Um, belly breathing. This is a very simple technique you can teach to even very young children through adulthood. The idea is you put your hand on your stomach and one hand on your chest and you're encouraging kids to breathe in from their stomach. So inflate your tummy like a balloon and then you breathe out and deflate. Another technique I'd love is breathe in like you're smelling a flower hold it and then blow out like you're blowing out candles on a birthday cake and have them repeat that a few times. Having a mindful meal. So, so many of us, and I'm guilty of this myself, we're making dinner, we plop down in front of the TV, we're watching a movie together and we're all eating our food, but we're not really focusing on that meal. So having time where you sit and notice your food can be another way to encourage that relaxation response when you're eating. Um, Meditation, there are some wonderful meditation apps that are available. Just getting in a comfortable, relaxed position, finding something you can focus on like your breath. Um, this is where I think those apps can be really useful, especially for teenagers where constantly on their phones or in their tablets. Instead of telling them to put it away, say, hey, I wanna show you something. There's actually a really cool app on here. Did you know LeBron James is on the, uh, the Calm app? I wanna show you something that he's, he's doing to get ready for big games. It's actually something you could do too to help yourself um, perform better or calm down, et cetera. Blowing bubbles is another way to use that slow controlled breath that can help to calm the body down. Coloring, focusing on, um, many of you have seen the mandalas and other coloring books, encouraging kids to color and focus on designs. Music can either upregulate you um, or downregulate you. So children, you can have them listen to a song, have them describe how they feel in their body and their mind, and then play a different type of music and see if they notice a difference between each song as a way to use music to help them relax. And the reason these techniques work, they're, they're for different reasons. The progressive muscle relaxation is stimulating those um, proprioceptive centers in the brain where doing deep breathing focuses us and helps to stimulate the vagus nerve. If all of you have had children, you know when your baby cries and you pat it on the back, it, it, they stop crying typically or it slows down they're focusing on that physical um that physical connection is is calming down certain areas of of their brain so that's why a lot of these relaxation um, techniques involve that um, physical connection next slide please so here's just a few resources that are out there there are a lot um, of different resources but some that we really like um, belly breathing like the one on sesame street that you can go online and find breathe think do is an app also by sesame street and again this is for parents of younger children it's available for free in english and in spanish the calm app is a great one 
Calm, Headspace, 10% Happier are, are all meditation apps, um, but have different things for, for kids on there as well. Super Stretch is one that has kids um, have different yoga positions that they can do. Go Noodle is a website that has a lot of different relaxation um, and calming strategies. Relax Melodies allows you to, to pick songs and different sounds that are relaxing for that child and they can customize their own sounds and you could do that before bedtime um, or whenever they're stressed out. Breathe to Relax is another meditation app that you can choose, you know, two, five, seven minute um, time slots for them to practice breathing or listen to some sort of meditation. And then I mentioned already the progressive muscle relaxation exercises you can do on YouTube and other places. So regulation involves two tasks when it comes to feelings. We need to be able to identify what we're feeling and then modulate it or figure out how we're going to either express or control that feeling. And when you're under stress, it's a lot harder to name how you're feeling. And that goes back to what Heather was talking about with what's happening in our brain when our amygdalas are firing. Um, it's a lot harder to stop and say, oh, well, I feel really frustrated and worried right now. What we're trying to do with our children is help to give them the feelings language to talk about what they're experiencing. We know, and the research supports this, that the more kids have the actual feelings vocabulary to express how they're truly feeling, the less likely they are to use maladaptive negative coping strategies um, or acting out behaviors if they have the words to be able to talk about how they're truly feeling. And the way in which kids learn that is by modeling, by watching us, and uh, by us also intentionally teaching them different feelings words. And the schools are incorporating this type of thing into socio, uh, social emotional learning programs. Um, but we can also do this at home for our children in a number of different ways. And kids will oftentimes go to anger as a default. And you all know what I'm talking about. The, the, all of a sudden you're in the middle of something and there's the tantrum and, and the tears and they're mad. And that's all they can express when really how they may have felt in that situation was embarrassed or frustrated or um, they're really disappointed that they can't see their friends right now. And so part of that is giving them the language. Um, next slide, Heather. And this just shows a little bit, a, a bit more about what I was saying that anger is oftentimes at the surface when, and that's what we see and that's what can be frustrating as parents to deal with because oftentimes associated with anger is that behavioral response uh, that we're working with. And, but beneath that is our, can be other feelings that are harder for kids to express and talk about um, until they have the, the, the language. And so that's one thing that we can, can help our children with. And so by doing that, we can name feelings. So as a parent, you could intentionally name, you know, three different feelings each day. Make a note to yourself to do that. I'm going to name, and they can't be all from the same category, by the way. Inside Out, if you haven't seen it, it's a therapist's dream um, for a movie. But it's also really helpful for parents, too, because it helps us be able to talk to our kids about, look, every feeling has a, meet, a purpose. Right? It's not a bad thing to have anger or sadness or disgust. Every feeling has a purpose and it's okay to have those feelings. And you can have different feelings at different intensities. I can be mad or I can be really, really mad. And so that movie actually helps us be able to talk with our children about different feelings. So I encourage you if you haven't seen it, um, it's a great one to watch with your kids. And um, you can point out how the different um, characters each have a, each have a purpose. And so encourage you to name feelings in, let's say you're watching a movie together, how might the character be feeling? If you're talking with your older kids, um, you know, name the latest Kardashian scandal. Well, how do you think Kim feels now that they're not gonna be on the air? So whatever it is that your kids are into, use that to engage them in conversation about and just start practicing using feelings, words beyond just um, mad, happy, sad, and, and scared. All right, next slide. So behaviors, how to deal with challenging behaviors. And I know so many of my friends and myself and so many of us have noticed changes in our children once the pandemic hit, especially when they um, were doing the remote learning. Many of us are working from home and trying to manage things as well. And we're seeing more acting out behaviors in our kids and that is normal. It's normal to see that in times of stress. And as Heather said, it goes back to regulation and including regulating 
ourselves. And what we really need to be doing is prioritizing the regulation of our kids even over academics right now. We are not all trained as teachers, right? Um, we're parents first. And so the best thing we can do for our kids in order to help them learn is to help to keep them more regulated. And the way we can do that is to also to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves too, which I know is easier said than done um, when we're busy parents working from home trying to figure out how the heck we're gonna do this. Um, but also know that challenges that come up can also be good things. As Heather talked about before, when a stressful event happens, it can actually, if if you have that supportive caregiver relationship, this stressful experience can actually help to increase kids' ability to tolerate stress in the future, including when they're grownups themselves. So we're going to we use the CDE of addressing behavior. So starting at the beginning, we're going to use the CDE. So the C would be curiosity. As I said earlier, every if we think about our kids' behavior, every behavior has meaning. What are they trying to tell us? Putting our detective hats on and knowing that our behavior is oftentimes connected to a feeling that we have or a thought, what we're telling ourselves about that situation, such as, you know, I'm never gonna see my friends again, or not seeing my friends means I'm gonna lose my friend group. And then we might feel rejected, upset, anxious, lonely, and that might impact our behavior. Maybe we become more withdrawn. Maybe we're acting out more at home with um, our parents. And so what we wanna do is really explore what the behavior is instead of, and I know this is easier said than done, reacting immediately to that behavior, take a step back, what is Johnny trying to tell me right now? Um, and trying to explore it more with our detective hats on. And the expression we like to use is let's get curious, not furious. And we have this um, cute little cat here. As, as parents, as caregivers, if we get curious, not furious, if we, if we avoid reacting, we can get a better understanding of what, what our children are are really trying to tell us right now um, with with that behavior. Um, I have one of my children who had a really hard time doing Zoom and she would get very upset whenever we had a Zoom meeting and she'd push the computer away, she'd snap at me, she'd have, you know, get really sassy. And I'm like, it was driving me crazy because I'm trying to get work done and I'm in the other room doing, you know, talking to people and um, trying to run our programs. And I kept checking in with her and then and it was frustrating and I found myself losing my own temper. And then I started to think about it and we sat down and talked and for her, seeing her friends reminded her, she's my social butterfly, seeing her friends reminded her of a, of a loss that she can't have that right now. And so we sat down and talked through that. Um, but it was a really good example for me that you know, we're all gonna have a tough time right now. And I've got to kind of shift my approach with her too and get curious about what is she trying to tell me when she pushes that um, the computer away or uh, doesn't want to jump, jump on her Zoom calls. And then the D, distress tolerance. We're helping our kids manage their distress kids can't do it if we can't manage our own distress and it's a stressful situation we're all in we're all trying to figure it out and so we first need to check our own emotions first and how we're responding sometimes what i'll do if i find myself getting distressed and we coach parents about the same exercise or technique put your hand on your heart starting to get uh, you know upset okay what do i need in this moment what does my child need in this moment? And then what do we need? So it's a three-step process. So what do I need in this moment? Put my hand out here, what does my child need? And then think about it in your mind, bringing those two together. What, what do we need for the two of us together? So we first have to check our own emotions, managing ourselves before we can assist our child. That idea of put your own oxygen mask on first before assisting your child. And so we can do that by connecting with our own friends, um, our own support circles, asking for help when we need it, um, encourage you to, you know, connect with your child's school and teacher and, you know, they're trying to learn how to do this just like we are too. And um, reaching out and, and doing that affiliate response by connecting with other people is one way to manage our own stressors and double downing on double doubling down on our own self-care and, and really taking care of ourselves so we can take care of our kids. 
Next slide. And then the E, encourage purposeful action. So once a caregiver, once a parent has gotten curious and not furious and has demonstrated that they can tolerate distress, that we can do this, we've got this, we're gonna do this together, we're gonna get through it. I don't have all the answers, but we're gonna figure it out. Um, then they can help the child do what we call encourage purposeful action. And when everyone is stressed, we don't know what that action might be. But going back to the basics, um, we when the caregiver has addressed their own distress, their child's distress, we can then figure out what that plan is going to be and help our kids be able to create the narrative about this experience. So we will look back on this time and say, remember when that pandemic pandemic happened and we were all stuck at home and we didn't know if we should get takeout or not get takeout and who we should you know talk with and who we can't talk with um how kids tell the story does matter Na our narratives matter and we can help our children with that um we are creating this road right now as to what it's going to look like we don't know exactly but we can help our children um and one technique we can use with that is what we call the cognitive triangle so this is a technique that we teach in therapy but it's one that you can you don't have to be in therapy to learn this technique or to use it effectively so the idea is that you've got a situation and you've got a thought about that situation what's your brain telling you so i might say to my child what's your brain telling you about this situation well, I'm missing out. I'm going to lose my friends. So the situations I can't go to school because of COVID and have to stay home and do remote learning. And I'm, what's your brain telling you? I'm missing out. I'm going to lose my friends. Nobody's going to like me. And so now here we go. So well, how are you feeling about that? What's that feeling? When you have that thought, I'm missing out. I'll lose my friends. Nobody's going to like me. I might feel worried or angry, sad, disappointed, frustrated. We can help them to add to that list. And what might your behavior look like if you're feeling worried, angry, or sad? Maybe they become more withdrawn. Maybe they're staying in their room more often. Um, or maybe they're lashing out at their parents or fighting more with their siblings, being a lot more aggressive um, with their siblings than they used to be. So the idea is that you can change the way you feel and what your behavior looks like And this children, even young children can do this by changing the way you think about a situation. So if you change your thought, just like you might change a baseball hat, you can change the way you feel and what your behavior looks like. So we'll practice that on this next slide. So same situation, we can't go to school because of COVID-19. But what's a different way we could think about that same situation? What's a different way our brains could tell us about that same situation? You know what, these kinds of things have happened before. Um, children all over the world are affected by this. It's not just me. Um, I get a chance to spend more time with my family. I've had a lot more time outside um, this year. I will be able to see my friends again. This is temporary. Doesn't feel like it right now, but this is temporary. So if you have any of those different thoughts, um, whether it's this is temporary or I get to spend more time with my family, how might you feel? Well, I might feel more appreciative, relaxed, content, um, happy, grateful, not those same feelings I had before. Maybe I'm still a little anxious about everything, but it's not gonna be the same intensity. And so if you're feeling more appreciative and happy, what might your behavior look like? Maybe you are engaging in what we call approach behaviors, reaching out to other people. Um, maybe you write a letter to friends or try to FaceTime them or talk to them on Facebook Messenger or figure out how to do a socially distant play date with, with friends um, or family members, calling up grandparents, et cetera. And one other skill I wanted to talk about um, for when you don't know what exactly to say to your child. Reflective listening is a trick they teach us in how to be a therapist 101 school. And I'm gonna teach it to you. And what we wanna avoid doing is if our child is struggling with a problem, jumping in immediately and solving that for them. Because that doesn't teach them you know, problem solving skills. But what it also does is sometimes if you jump in right away and try to solve the problem for kids, they don't feel heard or like, you know, mom gets me, your dad understands me. So the first thing we want to do and is stop what you're doing. And if you can't stop in that moment because you're cooking dinner and responding to 15 different emails, which I'm known to do myself, um, what you're what you're saying, you know, Carter sounds really important. Give me a minute and let's sit down at the table and talk about it. And so getting down, sitting at their eye level, if you can, um, 
at, at a table or, or someplace where you can get more at eye level so that you're giving them that eye contact. You're paying attention to them. They're saying, okay, dad gets me right now. Mom understands me right now. You continue to pay attention and instead of jumping in and trying to solve the problem, you stay neutral. Even if it's hard to do that and you have to put your poker face on, remaining neutral, you're nodding, you're listening. And then the next step would be you're actively listening. So you're doing that nodding, listening, and getting ready to re paraphrase back to them what they said to you. And when you paraphrase back to them what they said to you, um, you know, Jack, what I heard you saying is you were really frustrated when you couldn't log on this morning. Um, do I have that right? When you rephrase and empathize with them, what you want to try to do is point out a feelings word, how that child might feel. If they use, if they say, I felt really upset, then say that back. Um, or you could say, gee, I wonder if you felt frustrated, angry, or sad. Um, continuing to listen to them and then ask them, do I have that right? So again, um, Jack, what I heard you saying is you felt really frustrated when you couldn't log on this morning and see your friends. Um, do I have that right? And they could say, well, I wasn't frustrated. Okay, help me understand what you said. So you're reflecting back to them what they're saying. The idea is you don't have to solve the problem. The ultimate goal is for children to feel understood like you get me. We want to, especially when kids are under stress or have some, when that stress system is activated, nothing that you're saying at a logical level is gonna kick in. You've got to connect before you redirect them. If there's a behavioral issue, the same thing, you connect before you redirect. And this is a skill that you can use for younger children through adulthood with your significant other. Um, it, the idea is that the person on the receiving end feels heard and understood, and that can help to increase your connection. And that connection we know is what's going to really bolster children's resilience in all of this. Next slide, Heather. Thank you. So just a few suggestions for remote learning. I know um, most of us are doing remote learning right now. There may be a hybrid model happening down the road here. Um, but the more we can prepare ourselves as parents, the better off we'll be, knowing that you can't prepare for everything and not every day is going to be a perfect one. Um, having some sort of space for your child, whether it be a school space or workstation, uh, is highly suggested have it free of, relatively free of distractions. You're not gonna be able to stop dogs come, from coming in and out, et cetera, but you don't wanna have it in the same room where the TV is. Um, and maybe do a practice run, if that makes sense. Have a charging station at night, or unless they have a place where they can just plug it in and keep it at their, at their school space or workstation, that will save you a lot of headaches. Um, I have a number, especially for people who are, many of us who are either working outside the home or working in home while our kids are all logging on to school, I'm trying to do as much preparation the night before, just like when they're going to school. Um, so I might make lunches and snacks and have those in the fridge um, so they're there and, and good to go for during their, their school day. Kids in general benefit from having a visual to accompany what it is that you're saying to them. So some sort of visual schedule. It doesn't have to be complicated. Younger children especially, or kids with developmental delays or um, learning disabilities, having pictures that demonstrate each, each thing that you're going to be doing. Um, so it could be, you know, wake up, we have a picture of a sunshine, eat breakfast, a picture of food, or you could even make this together over the weekend, make it some sort of picture where you cut out um, pictures from magazines, but have that schedule so they know what to expect. It does, you don't have to have everything scheduled on 15 minute increments, but again, back to that idea that routines can be calming for children. Stay connected with teachers. That affiliate response also applies to working with with teachers and working with the school, finding allies in the school that you can connect with if you're struggling. As a parent, um, if your kids are struggling, I encourage you to reach out to um, the school and, and let them know what, what you're struggling with. If you, if, if, if you don't tell them, they don't know. Um, so I encourage you to do so. And then the last thing on here, and part of it's out of my own headaches, <laughs> Dealing with the internet, having to call, you may have to call the, the internet company a few times to have them reset if you're having problems with your Wi-Fi. Um, we've learned that here and some friends have learned that the hard way. So making those calls before um, next week will probably help you out a lot. Um, you know, sometimes kids don't have to get, there are some parents who want their kids to um, 
get totally dressed up in an, in their school uniform and um, you want them to be comfortable. It might help just for the shift to change into school clothes so they're not sitting in their PJs all day like we all were doing in the spring, but some sort of, you know, getting ready for school just to help them um, change their mindset about what, what's coming next. And then having a, some sort of check-in with your child um, where you're checking in the beginning of the day, what do you have coming up today? Do you, you have what you need? And then a check-in um, at the end of the day. And this goes holds true for adolescents as well. You know, what did you talk about today? Um, what do you have to do for tomorrow? What did you learn today? Um, have them show you your work so you're also feeling connected to their work as well. Um, and even if they're operating pretty independently as adolescents, you still want to do that check-in. Younger kids, they're going to be checking in with you um, even before you check in with them. And then managing screens, just a few suggestions. You know, screen time can be hard on all of us. Um, you want to check and make sure the dimness is comfortable for your child, um, that the space that they're sitting in is comfortable. They're probably going to want to wiggle, things like that. Teachers will have are much better at um, handling some of this than than we are, um, and we'll encourage breaks and and stretching and things like that. Um, encourage them to and older kids will get this easier than younger kids the 20 20 20 rule so every um 20 minutes for at least 20 seconds look 20 feet in front of you it's something so you can stare outside a window just to take a break from the eye strain so um, every 20 minutes for 20 seconds stare at least 20 feet out um, away from you can help with that eye strain as well and then a few more things on routines um, in just a way we can help our children with creating routines. Having a family night during the week um, can create more predictable routines. So maybe Tuesday night is going to be game night or Tuesday night can be taco night and Wednesday night's game night and Thursday night is a uh, Disney movie night um, after as a way to celebrate all the, the hard work that they've done with with learning but having some sort of routine you don't have to have a, a night theme for every night but if you have a couple of, of nights dedicated to a certain activity each week that kids can come to predict and rely on um, that can be helpful having a bedtime routine starting now um our my oldest has been living his best life uh this summer and but starting that bedtime routine now so that they can get in a a place where they're able to wake up um, at the same time each morning and they're not overly tired. Um, starting to wean them from screens um, earlier, uh, if, especially if they're doing a lot of screen time now, they're going to be on screens for school. Um, weaning them off of screens in the evening, as many of you know, is strongly suggested before kids go to bed at least an hour or so before um, bed, not having screens on. Heather mentioned earlier, keeping the news, not keeping the news on and running in, in the household, um, just that constantly hearing about COVID and other things that are happening can be um, more anxiety provoking for children, for parents too, by the way. But paying attention to how our kids are sleeping, if they're not sleeping well, they're typically, it's going to affect all the different areas of their functioning, emotional, behavioral. Kids that aren't sleeping well are more dysregulated. So if that continues to be a problem, encourage you to use those relaxation skills, practice them together in the evenings, do sleep hygiene, like turning screens off at least an hour before bed, maybe even earlier for some kids. Dimming the lights in the house an hour before bed can be another strategy. Um, you could listen to music, have some sort of bedtime routine. If you haven't um, started one up again, it's a good time to start. Um, and then if they're really struggling with sleep, encourage you to contact their pediatrician to talk about um, what, what those options may be. But it, relaxation skills, re regulation skills can help all, quite a bit with sleep, especially if kids are um, feeling reassured and, and safe, they will tend to sleep better and celebrating that first day. So making sure just like we'd celebrate the first day of school and there's a picture at the bus stop, we still wanna have those routines and traditions. It's gonna look weird and it's gonna look different this year. Um, maybe they have masks on, maybe they're going down to the bus stop but not getting on the bus, but doing the socially distant picture with friends. Um, some way to celebrate that first day. This is still a big deal, um, even though it's not the way we want this to be happening. We wanna make sure we're celebrating these successes and and um, celebrating some, you know, this is still a big deal. It's the first day of school coming up. 
And then last random note here is for kids who are on social media and your teenagers who are checking Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and all the, all of the, it might be helpful to limit their number of check-ins to a certain number of times a day, like have them, you know, social media time three times a day, whatever works best for your family. Uh, the reason for that is you can get so caught up in the scrolling, 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 that they can end up cutting into their time, into their sleep and in their ability to get their work done that they need to get done. And then lastly, not expecting perfection. We're still figuring out how to do this. There is no manual for how to parent during a pandemic. It's not easy on anybody. Um, just know that, you know, as Heather had said earlier, kids can adjust to new routines. They learn, you know, the first week of kindergarten that things are different here and they get used to it to routines and they can adapt. So we've got to give them some credit for that. Um, and then seeking help when you need it. If you find that your child is really struggling, seeking help, whether it's from schools, teachers, um, or mental health providers, making sure you seek, seek that help, including for yourselves, whether it be reaching out to friends um, or family members for additional support or assistance, um, or even you know talking to somebody professionally and not forgetting those three R's. So if you remember anything from today, those three R's are the ways in which we can really help to promote children's resilience. That's reassuring them that they are safe, that they're loved, that the grownups are doing everything we can to figure out how to make the most out of this. Um, and we will get through this, those routines, having some sort of structure, predictability, things that they can expect, things that they can count on. And then lastly, those regulation skills. So giving them the language for feelings and being able to employ relaxation skills to help to calm their bodies down. And then I wanted to let you all know about a service that we have. So the Child Trauma Training Center we have what's called Link, at Link Kid, which is a statewide referral system. We started piloting this back in 2012 in Worcester and Hamden County, and we're now statewide. And this is specific to children who've experienced trauma and are symptomatic and in need of mental health services. So we work um, very um, quickly to try to expedite children into trauma-focused therapy if they have experienced some sort of trauma, uh, whether that be traumatic grief and loss or other types of trauma and are symptomatic. And if they need mental health services, they can contact us. We do a trauma screen on the phone. Um, it's run by, uh, by uh, multiple clinicians and we expedite getting kids into um, evidence-based trauma treatment as fast as we can. And I know that was a lot. Um, but we have time for, I know we had asked for folks to send in questions and Heather and I want to try to be as useful to you all as, as possible and address, I know we had a number of questions that, that came in. So Brendan's going to share some of these with us and then Heather and I will do our very best to answer them, knowing that we don't have all the answers all the time either. Absolutely, so I'll project that. Thank you both for that uh, very thorough and timely information this will be um you, you'll be able to look back at this and, and watch it which i think uh will be helpful uh, there's so much important information in here so thank you both so much um, so i'll read the first question when we observe heightened stress among grown-ups at home how can we help shield our kids from that or help them process it later so i'll jump in here you know i think having increased stress and having kids see increased stress itself isn't bad. Kids know that we're human too. It's how we manage ourselves, you know, making sure that we remember that kids are learning their skills of regulation from our skills of regulation. So want to make sure that if we're going to behave some way, recognize that what we do may be imitated by those kids the next time you see it. And so what you want to do is make sure that you're reaching out for support for yourself, using other affiliate sources for support from other people in your world. Is there a partner who can help you deal with stress? Are there neighbors or friends that can help you deal with stress? Can you discharge that stress with those people? Thinking about if the stress relates to your child, are there other adults who know that child that can help you discharge that stress? Is there a pediatrician you can talk to? Is there a mental health person, someone from your faith community that can help, help you manage that? Of course, we're all gonna have our moments and helping kids to process it can also be a way to teach resilience. Look, mommy got so frustrated 
when I was trying to do work and I couldn't make our computer system work that I really, I got more upset than I usually do. What do you think you saw there? How do you think you would handle it if this happened to you? How else could I have handled it? Working with our kids in ways that allow them to see that we're human too, but also use it as a way to grow in their resilience and bouncing forward. I think those are also opportunities to, you know, model for kids how, you know, it's just as important to be able to learn how to say I'm sorry as it is I love you. You know, I'm sorry that that happened and ex explain what it is that they saw. But I think it's a it's a look at it as an opportunity to to uh, practice some of those skills. Thank you. Next question. How can I help my daughter cope with the unknowns? For example, we don't know when the pandemic will be over. We don't know when she will go back to school. Yeah, and I think Heather talked some about this earlier and just about our role as emo emotional containers for our kids, right? And that we can hold that for our children that, you know what, honey, it is, it is really frustrating, isn't it, to not know all the answers. And right now, all the grownups are doing everything that they can, or you know, the grownups who are in charge of certain things are doing everything they can to try to figure out those answers. And there are a lot of things that we don't know, but here are the things we do know. You still are going to have this home. We are still going to be together. Um, there still will be food on the table. The things that you can reassure kids about in order so that they know that they are safe, that their needs are going to be met, and that the grownups are doing everything they can to try to, to figure this out. But then acknowledging how um, it may be frustrating. You know what? I, I feel frustrated too, and I wish it was different. I wish we could do something different. But right now, this is. Um, this is, these are the cards that we're dealt with and we're gonna figure out how best to, to handle them together. Sometimes it's also useful to point out that unknowns are part of what trigger our fear response. We as humans do better if we know what's coming up. That's why routines help. And so allowing your, your child to feel unglued because it's unknown is in saying that that's how the body works. That's what you're supposed to feel when we don't know what's coming up. It is unsettling. And sometimes just putting it out there normalizes it and says, this is what our bodies do. And thank goodness, because that's allowed us to survive. So this is an important part of who we are as humans. Okay, thank you. Next question. My children's anxiety has become quite severe and she has already said she will not go back to school in November if the transition back to school begins. Instead of worrying about something that far ahead, what else should I be saying or doing? And I think this is when that, again, we keep coming back to the three R's. So reassuring her, um, I think also normalizing this, that, you know, it's, there are a lot of kids who are worried like that and, and feel that way. Um, but then encouraging her to practice those regulation skills. If her anxiety is, is as as parents describing extremely severe, I would encourage them strongly to connect with a mental health provider who can also help. There are a number of uh, mental health providers who are working remotely and are providing telehealth um, supports to kids and to parents as well. So if the anxiety is severe and it's it's getting to be, um, interfere with her functioning, I would strongly encourage them to talk with a mental health provider. Um, but then, you know, going back to those three R's, that reassuring her, um, and 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 it, it's hard to sort of predict predict the future and what's going to happen for for our kids. But letting her know that, you know, when if that transition happens, you have skills that you know you've been learning, and that we'll we're in this together. Yeah. The other point I will bring up too is that this is an opportunity to explore a little bit about the thoughts and feelings behind that anxiety and explore a little bit with her where's wh why what is making her anxious I, I don't know how old this child is but is it related to COVID is she afraid that she's going to become ill is she afraid of what will happen if she has to wear a mask you know there are lots of things that are new and unknown and sort of putting them on the table is the first way for us to deal with it doctor I mean um Mr. Rogers said that Anything that is human is mentionable, and anything that is mentionable is manageable. And that's a beautiful way of saying that, you know what, we have to be able to talk about what it is that is bugging us and what it is that's worrying us. And once we put it out there, actually what we do is we take it out of the lower brain and we bring it up to the higher brain. 
And so those are the steps that we will always need to use to kind of get beyond anxiety. If that's something that you can do with whatever age child this is, that's another way to go about it. Thank you. And Mr. Rogers really is the gift that keeps on giving. He was get some gems uh, as far as advice goes. Yeah, well, speaking of Mr. Rogers, another uh, you know, way to promote resilience in kids during difficult times is you know, something that he'd said that his his mother used to say to him, when there are stressful times, always look for the helpers. You'll always find people who are helping. And so that's something else we can do with our children if they're feeling anxious about what's happening. Look at all the doctors, look at all the people stepping up to try to do this. Look at how you know your teachers are trying to figure out how to do this differently. Talk about the people who are helping other people can be a way to be also calming for kids and help to promote their resilience. So the next question, my child eight years old has been exhibiting anger towards younger siblings in the form of hitting and pushing. This is very unusual behavior for her. Before COVID, she was an extremely friendly and kind kid. I'm not sure how to address the sharp change in her behavior. So here's a great opportunity to use your cognitive triangle with her. The behavior that you're seeing is anger. But really having a conversation with her when she's calm, can't do it when she's angry because she's in that lower brain. But when she's able to have a conversation, sitting down with her and saying, when you were last pushing or hitting or doing that behavior that you were concerned about, what were you thinking about? Or what were you feeling? And beginning to explore that with her is, is one of the first steps because until you identify what she's thinking and feeling, it's really hard to address the behavior. Yeah, and I think also that the other idea about putting your detective hat on and getting curious about what that behavior is about, um, is there a certain time of day that this is happening? Is there a certain type of event that's happening before you see her hit or push her siblings? And if you find that that's the case, you know, maybe it's that um, <laughs> my kids are all act out when I'm doing a lot of back to back you know, Zoom calls um, where they're not getting that sort of one on one attention exploring what what might be if you start to notice a pattern maybe write down when you notice it and see if you notice a pattern that can help to get some of those clues or data and figure out you know where is this coming from this is uh, the last question that we have uh, it's a big one <laughs> so what is the best advice that you would have for families during this time yeah this is a big one i think we i think we have a lot of advice we've talked about tonight um I know one thing that's been helpful, and we didn't we didn't talk about this yet, is this idea of special time in with kids, and this can look a, a number of different ways. But giving finding a certain time of day where, and, and it can be the same time every day, and if you have more than one child, it needs to be three different times. But where you spend just ten minutes with that child, um, doing some sort of activity that they pick. And it's predictable, it's the same time every day. You know, it might be that you're playing battleship and talking to one another. It might be that you're throwing the ball in the yard, talking with one another, you're coloring a picture. But it's at, it's 10 minutes a day where you can check in with your child. And we talk, you know, about time out and what that looks like, but this is actually special time in that kids can have with their parents. And it doesn't have to be more than 10 minutes. 10 minutes can be manageable. We can find that for our kids. And if we have multiple children, then we'll find different times. Times, but um, that can be one way to, to stay connected. And, you know, I think the, I also think about what my pediatrician has always told me, um, even when my children were very little, the happy mommy, happy baby, that if we're taking care of ourselves, if we're regulated, the more we're regulated, the better off our kids are going to be. We can uh, help to co-regulate them. We can help them to feel supported, understood, and, and connected because it really is the relationship that's going to help our children be resilient during this really tough time we're all going through. We can't solve all the problems right now for our kids, but we can help to increase their resiliency skills and um, and that's what's going to really help them in the long run from this stressful event becoming you know, toxic to them and, and causing long-term problems. Um, so that they can bounce forward like we had mentioned earlier. And I don't know, Heather, if you have different thoughts about this, but. I think that you have hit it on the head. And I think what we were also saying is remember to be kind to yourself and recognize that we are all going through something that has never been explored in our lifetime. 
and that it really is about relationships and that looking to each other, looking to your family, looking to the friends in your neighborhood, looking to the school, looking to your doctor, that's where we get our best support. You know, we have a saying in uh, that we're beginning to understand better. It's not about what's wrong with you, it's about what happened to you. And how we understand what's happened to us is through our relationships with others. The more we can reach out for support, the better off we all do. Okay. With that, that will conclude our uh, webinar here. I just want to take a moment uh, to thank you both, uh, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Forkey. Uh, I would say our, uh, our partnership with UMass Medical and the Child Trauma Training Center is uh, growing all the time. You've reached a lot of our staff and now many of our parents. Um, I just want to remind you to, to everybody, we've had a lot of questions about, can I watch this again? Or if people came in late, this will be archived and you can watch it later. So if you joined after dinner, uh, pretty soon you'll be able to go back. Uh, but thank you all for joining us and thank you very much to our, uh, our distinguished speakers. Thanks so much, Brendan. Take right. care, everybody. All right. Take care, all.